good to be here. Um, so yeah, I'm just uh, going to share my story with you guys, and uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to pray, pray us in. Heavenly Father, Lord, um, I just thank you so much for the opportunity, Lord. Um, God, you always just seem to be pushing me and um, helping me grow, Lord, and um, I just pray, Lord, that you just speak through me tonight and um, just touch touch us, Lord, with your word and um, just help us, Lord, to just take it and, and just run with it, Lord, in our life. And um, I just thank you so much for what you did in my life and what you're continuing to do, Lord. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, all right, so yeah, so I, I, most of you know me, um, but I don't think I've really ever really shared my my story. Um, and I'd like to share a couple verses too with you tonight. So I'll just start start off with my story. So um, I grew up in New Jersey. I was from uh, I moved around a lot. I lived in like Emerson, Bayonne, and then my younger years I was in Roselle Park, and that's where I spent most of my time until I was a teenager. And then I moved to this area in Manalpin. Um Backstory of my family is uh, I'm Egyptian. My parents, um, they ke- both came here from Egypt, so I'm first generation. And most of the people in Egypt are, are Muslim. So my, both my parents were Muslim. Um, and they both converted um, on different occasions, but that's another story. Um, so I was actually raised in a Christian home, but I don't really know if if I could say it was a real Christian home because my parents still had so many old Muslim values and stuff. So they really like beat Jesus into me and like Jesus as like a fear fear thing. So I was always scared of God and I didn't want to, I didn't really want a part of that. Um, I just didn't understand like why God would cast people into hell and this kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, I went to church and I got baptized and I kind of just did it because my parents told me to do it. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, early on in life, I, uh, I was out on the street a lot. Um, you can call me street kid, whatever. That's what my mom used to call me. Um, you know, skating and just being out. and just, I was always attracted to, like, the older people and what they were doing, and they were smoking cigarettes, and they were doing this. And um, I, had, I had a brother, you know, so we were, we were close, and it was really both of us doing this, but that's, I'm here to tell my story, not his. So, um, so I, first time I ever smoked weed, I was probably 11 years old. First time I had a drink, I was probably like eight. So early on, like, I, I would like dabble here and there. Um, first time I took pills, I was 15. First time I shot heroin, I was 16. So as you can see it just got worse and worse um at some point in my teenage years though I kind of stepped back a little bit because I really wanted to graduate high school on time and um I still smoked weed like every single day um and like probably messed around with pills and stuff like that um and my brother he was like full-blown he was full-blown heroin at that time so I was kind of stepped back from him too and tried to start my own life um, eventually, after high school, I left. I went to Texas when I was 19, and the plan was to go there and, you know, go to college and whatever, start a band, because I'm a musician, so I was like, I'm going to go there and, like, restart my life away from New Jersey, away from, you know, all my friends, away from the drugs and, and you know, whatever. So I go there, and that never happened. Um, I actually got worse. Uh, I started selling drugs and just like going out, hanging out different bars and like just selling drugs to all the people that went there and meeting people. And, um, I went to a college party one night. I didn't go to college there, (laughs) but I was going to college parties and, uh, I met this guy T and he was selling Coke. I was like, Oh, this is cool. Like, I'll just do it, like, you know, tonight, because I'm drinking, and I'll keep me up, whatever. And, uh, yeah, that didn't happen. I pretty much hit tea up every single day for the next seven years um, while I was living there. And uh, 
that snowballed into meth and heroin and all this stuff. And uh, I was living there, and I was living with a drug dealer, and we were selling a lot of drugs, like pounds of marijuana, and he had pills and this and that, and I was starting to get really scared because the apartment was in my name. But I'm also really thankful for that time because um, he actually helped me to kind of get off the heroin. Like, I went on a methadone program, and we would, like... At that time, we would stay up and, like, watch a lot of Netflix shows. And this Jesus show came on. It was called, like, Son of God or something like that. And I was really interested in it and not really interested in getting saved. But, like, I was like, oh, this is cool, like, history, you know. And we'd be high and, like, watching it. But uh, it was at that point where Jesus went on that cross and he died. And something just in my heart was like, this is... This is, like, insane. Like, why would anybody do that? You know, if this is really God, then it's got to be him. So at that point, I was starting to, like, get my interest in, in God and Christ and all this stuff. And I started reading the Bible a little bit here and there. But I, and I think I was getting more convicted. And I felt like I was going to die also. Um, so I decided to, to get off the methadone. I pretty much locked myself in my room for like four weeks because I was, it's really, it's a really bad time <laughs> to go through that. Um, plus, I remember I was going to visit here. I was going to come visit New Jersey and I made it a point. I was like, I don't want to be on this stuff when I go see my mom and this and that. So I came back here and just like a short visit, it was like three days. I was my height now, but like 45 pounds less. It was 120 pounds. So I looked really, I looked like really sick. And um, my mom knew, like, she could just see it in my, in my face. And I, I pretty much just, I told her everything, like, what was going on. And um, that night we, <clears throat> I got on my knees and, and I gave my life to Christ, for real. So I went back to Texas and I was lined up to start a new job at um, Wells Fargo Bank. And just something in me just kept telling me, just go home, go home, go home. So I went back. Within three days, I told my roommate, I was like, I'm out of here. I was like, you can have all my stuff. Take the apartment. I'm, and I got in my car, and I took my dog and, like, drove back. So um, came back to New Jersey, and I was not, like, clean <laughs> completely. Um, I came back and I just went right back to what I was doing. I was like, oh, I'm in close to Newark now, so I would just take trips to Newark and do drugs and whatever and drink and smoke and still go to church too <laughs> with my mom because remember I gave my life to Christ at that point. But I don't think I understood the Bible at that point. I didn't understand Christianity. I didn't know that God can actually get you through these things if you actually read his word. So that's pretty much my story, you know. Um, God is just so good to me, and I have a few verses I'd like to share with you guys. It's from 2 Corinthians. So it's, um, the main verse really is 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, but I have to go back because this book actually was split up into chapters, and verse... Seven, chapter 7 from verse 1 should actually be part of chapter 6 um, after studying it. Um, but I'd like to read, so I'll start off chapter 6, 2 Corinthians verse 14. It says, Don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? 15 says, What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among unbelievers. Separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things and I will welcome you. And when he says welcome you, that means he's receiving us. 18 says, and I will be your father and you will be my sons and daughters. 
says the Lord Almighty. Chapter 7, verse 1 says, Because we have these promises, dear friends, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our body or spirit. Let us work toward complete holiness because we fear God. So I just want to go back a little bit. When it says these promises, those promises are in chapter 6. I mean, there's tons of promises, but really we're talking about this, where God said, I will live in them, walk among them, be their God. They will be my people. He'll be our Father. So that's just so amazing to me. You know, I actually have a really good father, like an earthly father, but God loves me no matter what. All of the stuff that I ever did, he still loves me. I, like, I don't even feel um, like worthy to be even up here like speaking to, to any of you. But God loves me so much, and he's given me this opportunity. So when, he, when um, God says he'll be your father, you'll be my sons and daughters, and he wants us to be clean for that, right? Because it says... We have these promises. Let us cleanse ourselves. He doesn't say, I will clean you. I mean, yes, he will clean us, but it goes hand in hand. Like, we need to do the work, too. We need to clean ourselves. We need to clean our bodies. We need to clean our spirits. And by doing that, we read the Word of God, right? Because there's a verse that says we're renewing our minds, you know, by reading the Word of God. Ephesians 5 says that we're washed by the water, by the word of God. So basically, Paul wrote this. And actually, those verses, 16, 17, 18, those are out of the Old Testament. One's out of Leviticus, one's out of Ezekiel, and I think the other's out of Jeremiah. So, you know, he didn't just come up with this. He's actually going back to the foundation And he wants us to come apart and to be separate. Notice it says, let us cleanse ourselves, right? If the Father wants to bless me, how can that happen? You clean yourself. God wants you to take action in your life to clean yourself from the filth of your flesh. And it's hard. (laughs) You know, and I know, you know, I know, you know. (laughs) Because sin eats at you. It's a lot like leprosy. Leprosy starts below your skin. It's small, it's insignificant, and it spreads and spreads, and it eats away at you. And then if it goes unchecked, you start losing your fingers, it starts oozing, you start to smell, nobody wants to be around you, you are secluded, you're pretty much pushed out in that, back in that t- time in, in when leprosy was a thing. Now it, it could be anything. But if you think about it, when, like, I know when I was on drugs, I basically stayed in a bathroom or in my room alone all the time because I didn't want to be around anybody. I didn't want people to see me the way I was. So we cleanse ourselves by the washing of the word, like Ephesians said, and we renew our minds. And we cleanse not only our body, but our spirit by the reading of the word. Second Kings 5, there's a story about a commander in the army in those times His name was Naaman, and he was a great man, a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. So Naaman uh, was sent to the king of Israel to be cured, and the king tore his clothes and was like, how can I clean this man? I'm like, I'm not God. Am I God? So the prophet Elisha, he caught wind of this and told Naaman, go down to the Jordan River. I don't know if you guys know this story or not. He said, dip yourself seven times in the water. Naaman didn't trust him at first. He wanted like an instant healing, you know, God calling down and just like, like you're clean, you know. But he actually like, he had to have faith first. He had to trust God and he had to go do the work. He had to go and dip himself and believe that God can clean you. And I think that goes for all of us today. And it's hard. It's every day. Like for me, it's every day. Like I need to come to God. Otherwise, I'm just going to like roller coaster. You know, like I think... For me, like, I was taking drugs to, like, self-medicate and stuff like that. But you have to trust God. Um, So Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more than when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself. 
and his flesh was restored, and he became clean, that of a young boy. That's 2 Kings 5, verse 13 and 14. Ladies and gentlemen, our minds are dirty. Our flesh is filthy. We are sinful. And a sin takes thinking, and it takes planning, and it takes acting. So the second you get like a thought of a sin that you know you, you, you can't do, but you really want to do it, just go to the Word. Go to God. Go to Him in prayer. Because if you can just stop it at that thought, then you won't have to go to the planning and the acting. And talk to people, too, obviously. Like, I know we're big here on having accountability partners. Talk to somebody. So we want God's promises, and we want to please God, to be sons and daughters of God, to be received by Him. We need to just deal with it all. Cleanse yourselves by the washing of the Word of God. If you're here tonight and you feel cast down and out and worthless, remember God loves you no matter what, and he always comforts us and encourages us. 2 Corinthians 7, 6 says, but God who encourages those who, who are discouraged. So if you're here tonight and you feel discouraged and you want to talk or you need prayer or anything, you can come to me or any of the leaders here. So that's all I got, guys.